for years then we haven't even copyrighted our material we allow people to copy it to give it away that's what we want science tells us that every human alive today came from common ancestors the bible is right again amen amen wait what Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. Once again, let's see what they're up to on Eric Hoven's Creation Today TV show. We have with us a leading scientist known for his work in the Human Genome Project with the Institute for Creation Research. We have Dr. Robert Carter from Creation Ministries International. I always like to find out about Eric's guests, so here's the self-reported biography for Dr. Carter. He is a real PhD in marine biology from the University of Miami. I see that Dr. Carter is the sole author of a peer-reviewed paper in 2017 on mitochondrial diversity in human populations. Well done, Robert. That's definitely human genetics. But Eric said you were known for your work on the Human Genome Project. So I seem to have that prestigious project listed here somewhere. In 1990, a consortium of 20 international research centers embarked on the world's largest biological collaboration to accomplish this mission. The Human Genome Project proposed to sequence the entire human genome over 15 years with $3 billion of public funds. Oh wait, I see now. Robert works for the Institute for Creation Research on their genome project. So he didn't work on THE Human Genome Project, but A Human Genome Project. Fair enough. I'm sure Eric didn't deliberately word that in such a way as to puff up anyone's credentials. You know, check this out. In 1995, the journal Science published the results of a study in which a segment of the human Y chromosome from 38 men from different ethnic groups were analyzed for variation. The segment of the Y chromosome consisted of 729 base pairs. To their surprise, the researchers found no variation at all. Their conclusion was that the human race must have experienced a genetic bottleneck sometime in the not too distant past. Further research was actually done, and it was determined that every man alive today actually descended from a single man whom scientists now refer to as Y chromosomal Adam. Let's do a quick overview on the basics here so that we're all on the same page. All humans have two sets of chromosomes, one from our biological mother and the other from our biological father. Of the 23 pairs of chromosomes, one pair, the X and Y, or sex chromosomes, is mainly responsible for determining the sex of an individual. In the context of biological genetics, the female has two X chromosomes and the male has an X and a Y. Since the mother doesn't have a Y chromosome to contribute, the Y chromosome for any male must have been contributed by the father. Using gene sequencing, one can begin to trace backwards to common male ancestors of populations and far back enough to an individual known as the Y chromosomal most recent common ancestor. This individual is also informally called Y-chromosomal Adam, invoking the idea of the character Adam from the Bible. But that colloquialism leads to some unfortunate misconceptions. For example, as the Y-chromosomal most recent common ancestor, we identify the most recently living ancestor. Obviously, the father of this individual would also be a common ancestor, and his grandfather would be a common ancestor, etc. So if one takes the Old Testament as historically accurate, Adam actually isn't the Y-chromosomal Adam. Noah is the more recent common ancestor. However, it's also possible that we would have a more recent common ancestor even than Noah, if some of the lines of some of his sons happened to have died off. Similarly, it's not implied that Y chromosomal Adam was the only man living at the time. Again, if we go by the biblical account, Noah had his children while there was still a population of other men living around him, evil as they were. The Y chromosomal Adam was necessarily a member of a larger population. In fact, since the definition refers to all of those currently living, The most recent common ancestor can theoretically change over time as populations shift and ancestral lines die out. Mitochondrial Eve took a step further. While Y chromosomes are only passed down from father to son, mitochondrial DNA is passed down from mother to both daughter and son. Because mitochondrial DNA is only passed on by the mother and never to the father, never the father, mitochondrial DNA lineage is the same as the maternal lineage. Knowing this, scientists have found that every human alive can trace their ancestry back to a single woman, whom they now refer to as mitochondrial Eve. You may recall that mitochondria are substructures inside eukaryotic cells, basically any living cells other than bacteria and archaea. The mitochondria converts chemical energy from food into a form that the cell can use. Very handy. 
An interesting feature of mitochondria is that it has its own DNA, which is entirely separate from the DNA in the nucleus of the cell. While that nuclear DNA is a combination of the mother and the father, it so happens that mitochondrial DNA comes exclusively from the mother. Since there's no sexual blending of the mitochondrial DNA, any variations from mother to child can come from only one source, genetic mutation. As such, it's possible to track the matrilineal most common ancestor, as Marianne suggests. Just like Y chromosomal Adam, mitochondrial Eve would be the most recent common female ancestor, and again would have been one individual in a larger population. Equally important to note, there is no requirement, evidence, or even an expectation that Y chromosomal Adam and mitochondrial Eve were a couple, or even alive at anywhere near the same time. Wow! Now that is good science! Yes. And a great apologetic. Well, I'm glad you think it's good science, but is it a great apologetic? Let's jump to your guest expert. When does Dr. Carter place these common ancestors in our history? If we look at uh, Y chromosomes around the world, right? so the chromosome that makes men men, it's about 65 million letters long, and the common ancestor of all men in the world is only about 500 mutations ago, which is one or two mutations per generation for just a couple of hundred generations. You have a common ancestor. That's, that's like the biblical Adam. Okay, let me see if I can recreate that math. It sounds like Robert's formula is the number of mutations divided by the expected number of mutations per generation times the number of years per generation to get a total number of years. So, 500 mutations with 1 to 2 mutations per generation gets you biblical Adam time frame. Hmm. Based on Robert's other articles, I'm assuming that by that he means 6,000 years ago? Solving for the remaining variable, he must be using an average generation length of 24 years. Not unreasonable, though the Old Testament has people having kids well over 100 years old. I'm curious about the science behind this rate of 1 to 2 mutations per generation, though. To see if I missed anything, I went looking for articles or lectures by Dr. Carter where he might defend this two-per-generation estimate. But instead, what I found was this rebuke of any straight linear molecular clock rates for genetic mutation. Dr. Carter, how good to have you with us today. The biggest assumption behind most uh, molecular studies in evolution is called the molecular clock. It's the belief that, that mutations accumulate at the same rate in all populations. But that depends upon several things. It, make, it means that the generation time has to be the same amongst all cultures. It's not true. It means that they have to have the same number of children. The children have to have the same death rate. The population has to be about equivalent in size. And there can't be any mutations that affect the workings of the DNA repair enzymes. But every single one of those has been questioned, even in the evolutionary literature. It's strange that Dr. Carter just used the very kind of mutation rate estimate that he criticizes as having too many assumptions. He even went against his own advice in standardizing generation lengths. A paper published in Science in 2013 was among the first to take these kind of criticisms head-on and attempt to remove any such assumptions. First, I would note that the researchers found 11,640 Y-chromosome single nucleotide variants in their samples from around the world, a far cry from the 500 variant figure that Robert gave. For timing models, the study incorporated an array of tools, starting with a frequentist estimator that eliminates some of the assumptions of a straight molecular clock like the one Robert used. It cross-pollinated those estimates with Bayes probability simulations derived from empirical observations across geography, time, and other documented conditions. Finally, they compared the resulting phylogenetic patterns with human migration events that archaeologists have dated with high confidence. The genetic phylogeny and the archaeology were a precise match. Now that's a lot of words, and I'd encourage you to check the study for yourself, but in the end, the study estimates that Y chromosomal Adam lived between 120,000 and 156,000 years ago. However, in 2015, a genome res paper added 299 additional geographically diverse DNA samples to the initial sequencing. This additional data pushed the estimates for our patrilineal most common ancestor back to 254,000 years ago. As for Dr. Carter's mutation rate, it seems to be used because it was the one that generates the answer that he presupposed long before looking at the data. I wonder why Eric was referencing a 1995 paper when there are several 20 years newer papers available. It's also true for what they say is mitochondrial Eve. Mm -hmm. There's a little piece of DNA that we only get from our mothers. And if we build a family tree of all those in the world, and then we look at the mutation rate that we can measure today, it goes back to a woman who only lived a few thousand years ago. It didn't have to be that way, but it is that way, and it actually supports the Bible. Wow. Wow. Once again, Robert doesn't give us enough information to recreate his calculations ourselves, 
The phrase, mutation rate we can measure today, is quite vague and continues to fly in the face of Robert's own criticism of using standard linear estimates for mutation rates. Utilizing similar methodologies as the Y-chromosome mutation research, the 2015 study places mitochondrial leave at 120,000 to 156,000 years ago. This news actually really excited old Earth creationists because it put Y-chromosomal atom and mitochondrial eve alive in the same 30,000-year period, making it at least remotely possible that they were a couple. The 2015 study removes this possibility, though. Our Adam and Eve missed each other by over a thousand centuries. Wow! Now that is good science. Yes. And a great apologetic. Again, I'm thrilled that you embrace all the science, Eric. Well, the part of the science you like, anyways. But as for apologetics... Science's Adam and Eve lived at least 120,000 years ago and never met each other. That makes it difficult to share a rib or split a cursed apple. Do you know anyone who uses Y-chromosomal atom or mitochondrial Eve in defense of a 6,000-year-old Earth? If so, please forward them a link to this video so that we can all learn together. Before you go, please give the video a thumbs up or thumbs down depending on what you thought. Leave me a comment to let you know what you think about all this. And if you haven't already, please click subscribe so that you can stay up to date with all my future videos. Until then, later.